morning, everyone, and welcome to our April Frank Talks this morning with Franklin Tomorrow. I am Dolores Greenwald. I'm the Executive Director of the Williamson County Public Library and co-chair for our uh, Frank Talks. And I have with me Lynn Maddox and with Vanderbilt. And I would like to thank this morning Brian Wolf with Community Coffee. If you haven't had any of Brian's wonderful coffee this morning, you need to get some. It was ex most excellent. And Frank talks, and the donuts. He provided us donuts this morning too. Frank Talks is presented by Vanderbilt's University Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations, and that's Ms. Lynn Maddox. I'm going to hand it over to her. Thank you, Dolores. I'd also like to recognize Christine Bradley, who's the Vice uh, Ch Chancellor of the Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations. We're so glad you're here today. And I also want to welcome everybody. And we especially want to recognize our new partner for 2018, Renaissance Bank. And Diane LeBlanc is here, and we'd like to recognize Diane. Thank you so much. And now we would like to turn it over to Mindy and this fabulous panel, and we're looking forward to a great day. And thank you all again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, thank you, ladies. We're so glad to be here at Franklin City Hall for our Frank Talks, which is always held on the second Monday of the month. You may have seen as you were coming in the door some information about our historic Franklin license plate, which Franklin is the only city in the state of Tennessee to have its own license plate. And you can purchase those at the county clerk's office or online. Um, and those benefit Franklin tomorrow. Also, we have opportunities for you to be involved in our Mayor's Cup golf tournament through whole sponsorships. And so we hope that you'll look into that as well. But we're going to kick off this morning because we've got a lot to learn about how people and organizations are changing lives in Williamson County. We're gonna use video in many instances to introduce the organizations, and then we'll come back with um, questions and, and statements from our panel, but we'll go down the line here and use the videos to introduce the organizations. Next to me is Lance Jordan, who is Executive Director of Waves Incorporated. Waves is celebrating an anniversary this year, is that right? This is our 45th year. 45th year yeah. of serving the community and you had a recently had a breakfast and you had a great video we're going to see that now great. <laughs> hopefully e e t h very good these clients have a special feeling for people. Oh, yes. They have a love for people that's unlimited. If you don't want to get hugged, don't go in. Yes. <laughs> Through the work that all the staff do, whether they are working in a residential home, um, in job preparation, visiting families, working in our day program, working in our recycling program, what they are doing is they are creating an atmosphere where people can continue to grow as an adult, as a person, as an employee, and as a citizen of the community. Every person in this earth has a gift. And uh, even down the ones that can't speak probably shows a gift in some way. Know that these clients has a place that they can be their own. If they can be taught, they can have social life. That's important to clients, to have a social life. And to be loved and cared for. Roger was fine until he was about six months old and then he got very sick, was in and out of the hospital a lot, 
and had like double tonsillitis and ran a fever of 106. There was brain damage. And then also when he was seven or eight years old, he got spotted mountain rocky fever of all things. And all of that, you know, and made him have some mental disability where that he needed, he just really couldn't uh, function like, you know, um, other people in life. When WAVE started 45 years ago, there were very few options for families who had uh, a, a member that needed the services that WAVE was able to offer. At that time, if you had a son or a daughter that uh, had a diagnosis of an intellectual disability, the options were to stay at home and have mom or dad, and at that, in that period of time it was usually mom, uh, stay at home with them or reside in a state institution. Those families are the ones that got this program started. Those families went out on a limb uh, and they thought outside the box. They thought outside institutional life. They thought outside of what everyone was telling them to do. And they took a chance. They opened a center. They bought a van. <laughs> they started showing other people that there are options out there. It wasn't just something that happened overnight because this started happening probably in at least 69 and it was probably 70, well maybe 70, and it was 73 before we got the money. They were trying to discuss what they were going to call it. I don't know who said this, Mo might remember, I Catherine remember might. That. Somebody said, well, we want to make waves, we'll call it waves. That's Gail Langford. <laughs> so that's how the name came to be. The first day of, of uh, WAVES program, I'm thinking we had somewhere in the neighborhood 18, 19 clients. Very small staff. And now I hear that we have over 300 clients. How grateful we should all be that they went out on a limb and they were assertive and went to the county, went to the state of Tennessee, went to whoever they needed to and said, we want to make life better for our friends and our family members in the community. And they did it. They persevered and they did it. They got things started. My brain is flaming. I don't know which way to go. It's brought out talents we never knew he had. Rogers blossomed in a lot of ways because he's here. Roger or anyone else coming here for the day, that doesn't mean in any way these are the only people they are interacting with. They are interacting with uh, the people in the rec center. They're interacting with places where they volunteer, where they go to do vocational exploration or develop job skills. So Waves is helping Roger and the other folks who are here with Roger uh, become participants in the community not just at a WAVES program. He has a place that he, he can be himself. Right. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think, I thank God for it lasting all this long time. And I think back about the early days, and I have very, very good memories of it. I'm grateful for the pioneers who started the agency, and I'm grateful for the folks who work here now. I'm grateful for our volunteer board of directors. Over 45 years, we've evolved into serving uh, adults, and now we're serving from cradle to beyond retirement. And uh, that's pretty significant growth for a county that's grown so quickly, and I believe it's setting us up to continue to grow. Thank you, Waves. 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 Thank you, Waves.
Tell us a little bit about this video, though, just real quick. Well, I would love to. Um, High Hopes, by the way, we're about to have a, an anniversary, too. We'll be 34 year, years old this summer in July. And this video really was made by one of our older students who was just going to come and speak a little bit about High Hopes. We had no idea it was going to center around him. So you need to know this young man has pretty profound disabilities, but um, you will not know it. You'll hear it in his voice some. It was not scripted, and it is quite good, I think, to tell the mission of High Hopes to serve children and youth with special needs. So many students here every day walk without walking, move without moving, talk without talking. It's through the fantastic organization that High Hopes presents them with that ability. Each day, each, each classroom, each therapy session, you'll, you'll have that moment and you'll understand the importance of this, of this building and the impact it's had on children's lives. And I'm very happy because he's going to go into preschool and he is going to be able to interact and function in preschool in a meaningful way. He can do things now that we never expected. To be able to see her with the possibility of walking and running and, and living a normal life was an amazing thing. I'm gonna make it no matter what. There's an old story, I think we've all read it, the little engine that could, I think I can, I think I can. Well here in High Hopes, even if you don't think you can, they think you can. I, mean, I know I can do more. When she was born, we were told by doctors that she may never walk, talk, feed herself, dress herself. She has progressed beyond our wildest dreams. Absolutely the best decision we've ever made in our lives. Caleb is living a typical one and a half year old life right now, which is our best dream. And we thank all of that to High Hopes. But when she was born, the doctors told her parents that she will probably never walk. And she is walking down the hall, bouncing, just bouncing down the hall, just as sweet as you please and that's what happens here that's what this is about and that's why I'm in we were in a bad place we had no hope and here all of a sudden she takes her first steps and we see this is gonna happen she's got this we're gonna do it they gave us hope these therapists gave us hope They give high hopes to students and parents every day that progress can be made, milestones can be met, barriers can be broken. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. It doesn't seem like enough to say thank you, but thank you so much. I hope anything is possible, and I'm living proof of that. Next we, have, next we have Brenda Hall. Brenda, tell us a little bit about Brightstone and your video. Uh, Brightstone has a huge vision of growth and expansion right now, and in that process, we've had over 300 visitors come out over the past couple of years to see what's going on and to become aware of the needs. And uh, by the way, this is just very moving. It really is. And I know I may have a chance to say this later, but that you as leaders of this county consider these individuals and all the ages that we represent up here, uh, I just want to tell them thrilled. And I thank you for all the parents of individuals with special needs that you're valuing their lives as members of this community. And I want to thank you for that. But in the, uh, the visitors that came, one that came was Joe Elmore with Tennessee Crossroads and just came for a visit. And when he was out on our new property, looking at this beautiful Wibsa County land, he said, I've got to do an episode on Brightstone. And it's going to potentially be 
the one that brings coveted awards to my program. <laughs> so we decided today to show you this and let Joe Elmore take you on a tour of Brightstone. Special education classes are designed to help Tennessee children with developmental disabilities. But what happens when those special needs children become adults? Well, often the outcome is bleak, but it doesn't have to be. This is the story of a place called Brightstone in Franklin, Tennessee, and its mission of providing hope and productive life to some special adults. We focus on what they can do, not what they can't do. And they develop uh, friendships, uh, and, and the joy factor at Brightstone is incredible. Randy Elliott is Director of Advancement at Brightstone, founded in 1999 to serve adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, all without help from tax dollars. It's a school that promotes learning, personal growth, and the chance to live a meaningful life. Got it. He was bored. He really didn't have anything engaging to do um, besides what our family created for him. So he was, he was pretty lonely, I would say. He's very Amanda Humphreys grew up with a brother with special needs. Ryan had a lonely, empty life until Amanda and her husband discovered Brightstone. And the change that we've seen in him, it's, you can't even believe it. He is just excited every day to get up and go to see his friends. And he has purpose. He has um, just a family. He calls it his Brightstone family. I'm the big bird fan. Perfectly normal until he was 18 and he was in a car accident, totally unanticipated on a Sunday morning and it totally changed his life, totally changed all of our lives. That accident left Catherine Stallworth's brother Philip with a permanent brain injury. He's got an opportunity to, to belong and to contribute. And we, we often think about people with disabilities not having that need, but we all have that need. Ta -da! They are not Look only happy Look here, but they're productive good, here. So they have something of value to do every day and a reason to get up every morning which is what we all truly enjoy in our own lives. Brightstone's founder, Brenda Hawk, has dedicated her life to special education. She was determined to make this school one of social and work skills learning. It is on-the-job training in these classrooms, but they don't do one job all day long, every minute of the day. So they're able to pick and choose what they enjoy doing, being trained in a variety of things and not have to stay too long in one place. It's easy to see why everyone says Brightstone is very much like a family, but in fact, it's also a family business. Brightstone is a chance for students to really exercise their creativity and be a part of the social enterprise programs that we've got. So they're creating stunning ceramic products. Uh, their artwork is made into seasonal greeting cards. Uh, we are licensed and uh, permitted by the Department of Agriculture to uh, make food product that's branded under the Brightstone brand. We want them to have the greatest opportunity, whatever their disability is, to have potential for greater independent living. A number of the students here are only part-time, and there's a positive reason for that. You see, they now have part-time jobs out in the community, earning a little money and a lot of self-respect. Benny Weinberg works at Macy's in Cool Springs. He's a proud, productive member of the store shipping and receiving department. Benny, he's a, a hard, hard worker. I know with him, uh, he gives it his all. There's no, you know, sometimes he actually, we have to make sure he slows himself down a bit because he goes all out. I think sometimes his work ethic is contagious because they see that he's, he doesn't stop, you know, he just keeps going and that makes everybody think, oh, I better get, you know, be on my A game. <laughs> you might have seen the Brightstone bus around the Franklin area. It carries these adults who don't drive to the library or to exercise or to shop and will just merge into the community. We want them to enjoy the benefits of uh, 
of Franklin. And, and more than that, we, we want the non-disabled community to really have a chance to be around these adults. Uh, and when that happens, there's real community. Truth is, when you spend time with adults with special needs, they, they will bless and transform you. And we want the greater community to have that privilege of experiencing that. Since the beginning, Brightstone's Day School has improved the lives of students and their families. But now there's another mission, one that answers a question lingering in the minds of most parents, a question about the future. The heart cry of the families we serve, 100% of the families, is what's going to happen when they can no longer care for their adult. The answer may lie on a 138-acre tract of beautiful land off Columbia Pike. To Randy and Brenda, it's very much a land of dreams. God is continuing to direct our path as we plan for that future to provide residential housing options for uh, adults to permanently live in this college-like campus setting where they can work uh, and live and recreate right there on that property. I don't know when I'm going to live there. I don't know how I'm going to live there, but I will. Brightstone will be overseeing the care, the full life care of their adult that is so precious to them. To think that he could live somewhere and have someone love him and take care of him like we do, it's amazing. Great. And finally on our panel, we have Amy Saffle with Able Youth. And Amy and I became acquainted through a mutual friend and the former director of Able Youth, Ricky Slaughter, who I've known uh, through my childhood growing up in Nashville and into his de developing what was a tragic for him accident uh, that resulted in him being becoming wheelchair bound, but he turned it into a great opportunity. And tell us, Amy, a little bit briefly about Able Youth and then we'll play your video. Yeah, Able Youth was founded about a little over 20 years ago uh, by Rick Slaughter and he um, had a car accident when he was um, an older teenager and then became a um, internationally ranked uh, wheelchair tennis player and racquetball player um, and then uh, later in his career uh, was fitting kids for wheelchairs and he was always very personable and so he would you know ask these kids you know well what do you do for fun and um, he, you know the kids would say well um, I go to my brother's baseball game or I go to my sister's soccer game and he would say well that's what they do for fun what, what do you do for fun and they wouldn't have an answer they didn't have any activities that they could do um, so he decided that he would um, would found something and so um, Able Youth uh, was founded and we fuse um, independence activities with sports everything that we do um, helps kids learn to be independent usually usually using sports as a vehicle so um, we'll show the video and then I can talk about that a little bit later One, two, three, okay. When we found the program when Jay was four years old and found how welcoming it was, I did not feel like I was alone anymore. I can't even imagine a world without people understanding these kids and their conditions and noticing that they're not any different than you are. Emily Hoskin. I am the program director for Able Youth and I'm also a two-time gold medalist at the Paralympics. We think it's really important for kids in wheelchairs to be able to learn from each other and from other people that are in chairs and so we help them to learn how to navigate life in a, in a chair and it's it's different but we teach them that it can be done. I think it's made my life better by showing me that I'm not the only one with my situation physically. I've learned how to drive a car, get in and out of a car, get in and out of certain places. People with disabilities tend to have a much higher unemployment rate and we want to change that. We want to build our kids' desire to excel and teach them that they can do whatever they want to do in life. I'd say that Able Youth has given me a lot of independence. The finances that are given to Able enable 
these kids to be able to go to other competitions, enable them to talk to other kids with their conditions. They talk about college instead of, I'm just in a house, I can't do anything. You know, I wouldn't have known who to reach out to without Able Youth. So just to be able to breathe a sigh of relief that you don't have to worry about finances and your child can go out and live and laugh. It helps you to live and laugh and to forget all these other bills that keep stacking up. So I say thank you to anybody that has a heart that wants to reach out to this program because it matters so much. It builds a life experience. this morning that you've been impressed, enthused, and maybe um, urge, feel an urge to become more informed about these organizations. So we're going to spend some time talking about the organizations. And first of all, we'll just ask you to give your one minute elevator speech that you would give about your organization. If you were explaining to someone who you are and what you do, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I'm, Amy, I'm going to put you on the spot and start on that end okay. and come back this way. No problem. Um, so ABLE Youth is, we help kids starting usually about age two. We've actually had kids younger than that come. When they get their first wheelchair, they usually come to us and they uh, participate in usually wheelchair sports activities and independence activities. We um, have a monthly Super Sports Saturday that's here in Williamson County. Um, we have a travel wheelchair basketball team. This Saturday we did a 5K, and yes, we all did them, even kids that are young as, as seven, they all, in the weather, um, did the 5K themselves. Um, we have a yearly independence camp where kids um, who are usually 10 years old and older um, come to learn the um, independent skills for the weekend. And, um, you know, something about that is, is a lot of our kids um, have so much potential and they either haven't been taught or they haven't been, um, their parents don't, don't make them do things or, you know, people around them don't make them do things. And so our kids are very smart and they realize that, you know, if my mom doesn't make me clean my room, then I don't have to. And, and so we um, give them uh, a progress report of all the things that they've done this weekend and parents are very excited about this, that to see that, you know, when my kid says that I can't, um, you know, vacuum. Well, I have this piece of paper that said you vacuumed all weekend, weekend long. And um, so they hang, hang on to that. And that's, I think, is very empowering for, you know, for the parents just as much as the kids to learn that, you know, my kid has so much more potential than um, maybe I ever thought. Um, so, you know, as they get older, kids really learn from one another. They learn from one another that they can um, be independent. Um, the older kids help the ones that are newer, and we have a lot of kids that have graduated, gone on to college. We have our first um, Team ESA um, Paralympic hopeful in wheelchair basketball. She's been on Team ESA for a while now, and something that she has said was that, you know, when she joined our program that she had no idea um, that she could ever leave home, much less go 900 miles away to college, and then now she's traveling the world um, playing wheelchair sports. And so um, I think our, you know, our program has definitely made a lot of impacts on a lot of people, um, and so definitely we're, we're proud to do it and um, happy to be here. Thanks so much. That's great. Um, so Brenda, tell us your one-minute elevator speech about, uh, about Brightstone. Brightstone began in 1999 serving um, our adults. We now have 39 enrolled. Some of them have jobs so that there are uh, a varied amount coming each day. But we do provide an adult level of learning. So it is job training in the area of job skills and productive work habits. But then we incorporate in their day uh, community awareness. So we're going out into the community for activities, recreational and other activities. We're bowling and going to the Y or to FAC for exercise and going to the library, uh, going grocery shopping or to the mall or Walmart. Everything is very intentional. In fact, they have final exams at uh, some of the stores to, to see if they can accomplish the skills. Every student has goals and objectives that they are reaching in what we call a work-based learning program. So they're actually producing something of value. Instead of just sitting there doing a work adjustment piece, they're actually producing the lovely products. And they're proud of that. I can take a tour and walk in the room and say, ask them, what are y'all doing? What mix are you making today? And there's several of them. They know exactly what they're making. 
and they also usually know what it tastes like too. <laughs> so they're very excited about that. We are open Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 3.30 year round services, except for some holidays that we take off. But our vision for the future, I think, is the most exciting thing that's happening right now. Because once we opened, we found out very quickly two things. One is the numbers of individuals with special needs in this county, are, it's growing mm -hmm. exponentially. Mm -hmm. That shocked us in the numbers that we were encountering. The second thing we learned right away is that even though the day program is so vitally needed and desired by the families, what their heart cry was, what's going to happen when I can no longer care for my son or daughter. So our vision changed to expansion, and for five years now we have been working on researching what other states are doing across the country, traveling around, getting sort of the best of the best for Williamson County, and um, f forming a, a wonderful, strong board right now, developing a strategic plan, and we're being led by um, a great board leading us this way. Earl Swenson Associates are our architects, and uh, we're getting the engineer work on uh, Williamson County land. Some of you can uh, mm -hmm. vouch for how challenging that can be on our 138 acres with a step-by-step -step process that this year we hope to get most of our approvals. We are already entitled uh, through zoning to be on the, the property in Franklin's urban growth boundary area. And then we would um, uh, finish our funding do the construction work and be able to move in sometime, even if it's December of 2020, and that is our goal. Our students will tell you that date also when they come in to tour so they know about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's, it's a very exciting opportunity that exists on that property for sure. Um, so Gail, tell us a little bit about High Hopes and your, your kind of one or two minute elevator speech. Okay. It's hard to okay. do, but we're going to develop those. So <laughs> High Hopes Development Center serves children and youth in a couple of ways, and we've actually added a third way, but we have a therapy clinic where we provide physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, feeding therapy, orthotic services. And then we have a preschool where we have eight classrooms and children with special needs and children who do not have special needs learn and grow together there. A third program that we've just added in the last year is family support services. And those services are anything from financial planning to sensory friendly haircuts because many of these children cannot go get their haircut without screaming. So we have served uh, children over 50 diagnoses. We get our referrals from three sources according to surveys from physicians, from Tennessee Early Intervention System with the state, and from word of mouth. So you may wonder, well, why do all these therapies, why are they such a big deal? Well, we love to say that the children's hospitals are saving these children and we give them quality of life. We help them walk and speak and literally eat. So last year we had about 700 children served in our uh, therapy side, birth to 21 years. And yes, we'll see some of them in the home who can't be around germs yet, but we get them to the center just as quickly as we can where all of our equipment is. And then in the school, it was about 148 children last year. So we're, we're expanding too. And this thing of, you know, we hear every day that about 100 people are moving to the greater Nashville area a day. Well, the research shows one in five homes has a child with special needs. So if you break that down, there are about seven children a day moving to this area who have special needs, not to mention the families who already live here and are having children. So it is a very big deal. Uh, we too are in expansion. And uh, about three years ago, we were fortunate that a donor gave us the property next door wow. in Franklin, that's, Tennessee. Wow. Yeah, that's a gift. Still pinching <laughs> myself. And so we are expanding, adding four new classrooms, and we're adding more therapy treatment spaces. We are literally treating everywhere. If you come to High Hopes, they're in the hall, they're everywhere. Um, and then, uh, so we'll add more treatment spaces, a multi-purpose space where all of us can do things for children and families uh, together and, and better serve them. So we, I'd love to invite any of you to come for a visit. It's, it's, it's a very happy place, very happy place.
Thank you, Gail. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And after this, we're gonna, I'm gonna, if you have a question, we're gonna get ready and do those, and then we'll come back and ask some questions of the panel as well. But Lance, uh, so Waves has been around, I guess, the longest. Uh, and 45 so years. Give us the one or two minute elevator speech about Waves. I'm happy to. Um, as I'll bring up the 45 year thing again, just cause it's uh, great news. Um, the video focused on the origins of the agency and the day program. Uh, also want to let people know we provide other services. We have eight homes in Williamson County, two in Fairview, two in Spring Hill, four in Franklin, where people live and have staff support 24 seven. We have job development programs going on all over the county. Um, we have staff who are taking folks to either potential employers or their current actual employers. We have a group of guys who all live in their own apartments. We check on them all the time. Um, we also have a program that's called Early Learning Services and that supports children from zero to three years old. And a lot of time we do it in collaboration with uh, Gail's group. So there's a, a lot of cohesion there with the services and continuity, ensuring that those kids and those families are being set up for success. Um, Waves envisions a world where people with all kinds of abilities lives, works, and plays together, and we try to live up to that every day. That's great, and thank you so much for that. I want to see if you all have any questions before I go into my list. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask of any of our panelists? Oh, gosh. Hey, hey Mindy, I want to, oh. I just made an observation while watching all those uh -huh. videos. Um, Gail's uh, services and the services our early learning provide start from zero to three. Then it sounds like Youth Able gets the kids and works with them up until they don't want to compete anymore. Mm -hmm. And then Brenda and our agency, we get the adults and we provide service to them. Our oldest resident is 91. So this table supports Williamson County residents from zero to 91 right now. And that's pretty awesome. That is amazing. <laughs> Um, you touched on it a little bit, Gail, about how our community is growing and the statistic that one in five homes are dealing with a child with special needs. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Williamson County, through our school systems, whether it's Franklin Special or the Williamson County School System, is known for its uh, high level of services. How do you interact, how do you all interact with the school system, and is the reputation of Williamson County Dr making the need even greater than perhaps elsewhere in the Middle Tennessee area? That's a great question. And there was a law passed in the 70s, a federal law that children will ha who have special needs can ha or have the right to a free and appropriate education, birth to 21 years. And um, so the schools really can't take care of those babies. So the birth to three, we do provide therapy for them. And um, that we, the state contracts with us and with WAVES to handle the birth to three. Now, you understand we treat kids up to 21 years. So, uh, in fact, we have a 30-year-old, but mm -hmm. technically we go up to 21 years. <laughs> but, um, but we work very closely with the school system. Some of our parents many times, in fact, I, I was walked through a meeting the other day where parents and therapists and teachers were talking about when their child turns three, they can go to public school for therapies and for preschool. And some of our families do that because there is no cost associated with that. Um, we'll go with them if they want us to, to those meetings. We will help them. We will help that transition be just as seamless as possible and try to assure them they're going to be in great hands. Um, some families will go on at age three. Some stay with us until they're six or seven in our preschool. And then, um, they can get therapy in the school system when they go, but many of them also get therapy with us. So it's it's a hand in, hands joined approach on many of these things. That's a great way of thinking about it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Can I move yeah, on yep, that too? Please. Um, the school system, our special education program here in Williams County and Franklin Special uh, is awesome. fabulous. Mm -hmm. it, it's just amazing. And the collaboration has been wonderful. The Williams County and Franklin Special they, there's a population of about 42,000 students, and of that, in 2016 and 17, 11% were in special education programs. That's over 4,000 students currently in the program. 
and those will graduate needing post-secondary environments of some sort. And so what the school system has established, I thought was uh, very helpful when they contacted us and some other programs in the area to sort of do a transition. And we do call the class when they're ages 19 to 21, which is that opposite end. So I think you're hearing families have public school from age three to age 21. Mm -hmm. They do. And when I taught at Franklin High, that age group of 19 to 21 year olds for six years, I had to put a box of Kleenex in front of, the, of us at the exit IEP meeting. Because mm -hmm. there's no more school. There's no more transportation. There's no more therapy. There's no more what's mom going to do during the day if, you know, with, with a student at home now is what she faced. So they started uh, Transition School to Work program. And um, in that program, they now allow the students at age 20, I think it's age 20 and 21, to go to their next program a certain number of days of the week while continuing in public school certain days of the week. So we had a student for two days a week in our program while three days a week she went to, on back to high school for that transition program. And I think that's a real forward thinking um, uh, concept that the school agreed to. Any other comments on that um, challenge? So we're hearing that you all work together very well. Um, obviously, that's, that's great. But let's talk a little bit about the, where the rubber meets the road and that's funding. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you're funding your organizations and then any events that people can get involved in to support your organization. So, Lance. Um, I'm happy to start that discussion. First, I think uh, it would, it's important for folks to know that there, this isn't competition. This is a, a community collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I've made reference to the families who are supported by High Hopes and Waves, but also we have residents in our program who go to Brenda's Day Program. And uh, I, actually, Brenda knows waves because she worked for us 100 years ago during the <laughs> summer while she was a teacher. So there's all, all types of quality interconnection going there. And I think I want people to know that so that uh, if, you, if you're supporting one agency, you're supporting the continuity of services for everyone. I think feel that that's right. important. Um, as all nonprofits, we have to struggle with funding. The primary source for our funding is the Tennessee Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. There is also supplemental funding we receive through the Department of Education and through VR, some grants and a lot of fundraising. I'm lucky enough to have a great fundraising director who's here and she would have killed me if I didn't say that. Don't um, you have an event coming up called the Artist Window? Isn't we that coming do. Up? It's the Artist Window and it features local artists with disabilities, not just supported by WAVES, um, but we feature their work prominently, we allow it to be sold, all the money goes back to the artist. We I also have two pieces, one in my home and one in my office. Perfect, thank you. I didn't even have to tell you to say that. <laughs> and we also have uh, live performances going on. It's another interpretation of the, their artistry. So uh, I, if I had a date, or if Emily, what's the date? April 27th. April 27th <laughs> at the uh, uh, in Enrichment, Center. Enrichment Center over by the library. And it's free, so come come and learn about the artist in your community. Great. Um, so Brenda, te Brenda, tell us a little bit about your funding and how, and talk about your products a little bit. Oh, um, the funding is uh, always a challenge as, as Lance mentioned, but our students do pay a tuition and that covers a third of our total operating. It, it covers a little more of just the direct services a little over half of just the direct services alone. We do have a scholarship program and there is never an individual we have ever had to turn away. Even those that have been on welfare, live in a habitat home, we have never turned away one individual. We have a wonderful giving community that wants to help and our scholarship fund is approximately 30,000 at this point. We know it will go skyrocketing when we begin providing residential uh, services. So we're preparing for that now. Uh, so that covers about a third. The other two thirds is really in uh, fund development and I 
brought my director of advancement. He's standing in the back. He's in charge of getting all of that to Brightstone. <laughs> no, we do that through several uh, methods, and uh, Randy Elliott does lead this for us. One is uh, just general contributions from this caring community. It's just we will be in the office and somebody will run in the door waving a check. You won't believe what somebody just dropped off. And, and we rejoice and thank God for, for the gifting. Then we do have uh, grant writing that goes on. Ugh, it's exhausting. Exhaust. It's hard. Uh, it twists every part of our being. But we do write for grants and are very thankful. Brightstone being a private funded organization, we do private and corporate foundations and grants. So there's many families. Some of you may be sitting right here who have family foundations that we're so grateful that uh, you give to us in that way. And then we do have four signature events. Uh, that are fundraising in nature. One is our Songwriters Night, which we just held in February. And we have local songwriting artists who are fabulous and nobody knows their names <laughs> until they play that song and then we all get, get to know that person. And we have a headliner at the end of our event and this past year it was Michael W. Smith, but we've had so many wonderful artists from the Judds uh, to Trace Adkins and um, just so many I can't name because we've had 15, 16 of those events throughout the years uh, held at Liberty Hall. Mostly every February we try to have it then every year. Music That Touches the Heart is the name of that event. And then we have um, sort of a, uh, it's our event, but it's a little closed event that's a sporting clay shoot. Uh, if you haven't touched a gun, no, they will not let you come out and do the Sporting Clays <laughs> shoot, shoot on Gentry Farm. And that's been a very high cost entry, so we get a lot of funding from that. And then we have Bowlability, and that is one that I hope a lot of you have heard of because it is a very broad based support of the community to come pay a small fee to have a team to bowl at Franklin Lanes. We have four sessions for two nights, and it is probably the most fun you've ever had because <laughs> nobody can bowl. And then there's always that one high school student that can twist that ball and knock them down every time. But we have a really good time, and this community has supported Brightstone in that as well. And then we have a very unusual golf event. It's not a pay-to-play. They actually fundraise for each uh, golfer as if it's a marathon runner that's raising money for support. That golfer raises money for support, and we have it at the Governor's Club every year. And it has been actually our number one fundraising event as far as the monetary results of the event. So those are the four that we have, the grant writing, general contributions. We thank you and this community. Amy, tell us a little oh. bit. Of, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, go back. Did you have one thing? The products, to add? Oh. yes. Now, y'all, it brings in only 2% of our income, but it is to die for. They are very signature pieces. We truly want the piece that is sold. Uh, we want you as a community to want to buy it because it's a good product, not just to feel good as to who made it. Our adults are proud of their work, but we have artisans and we have employees that make sure there's quality control of the dry mix products, the fudge, the cookie mix, the tea mixes, uh, the soup mixes that they sell. They are selling locally in five or six different stores, both in Williamson and Davidson County. We're on Main Street at Savory Spice. We're at Handy Hardware. We're at The Batch, which is at the Farmer's Market in Nashville. We're at our local, um, I want to say historical side, do that. Not, visitor <laughs> Center <laughs> of uh, products made right here in Franklin. So we're, we're very pleased to have that. Our students don't work at one job all day long. So throughout their day, they're mingling and doing other things like going to the library or we have therapeutic yoga, um, uh, different exercises that they're doing, et cetera. And then we give them a variety so they can change and do another job at another work session. So our productivity is low considering the 39 students who are very capable to work. So selling to these local stores are just fine. But every now and then there's a large company that has wanted our product. So I think that's in our future to be able to ship to that. Great. Amy, tell us a little bit about how you fund yeah. your organization. Um, we have um, a lot of grants. We don't have any um, federal grants um, at all. Anything that we get um, 
is, is private grants. Um, and then the other way would be um, just donations by the public. Um, we have a golf tournament that's in September. Um, but other than that, we don't have a whole lot of events. So and it's pretty much either private grants or it's um, donations from the public. And I think that, um, you know, something else that I didn't um, quite say is that all of our kids um, have uh, physical disabilities. We don't really have anybody that has um, intellectual disabilities. Um, and because of that, um, they don't qualify to play, um, to participate participate in Special Olympics. Um, people don't realize that Special Olympics is for, um, is not for kids typically that have physical disabilities. Um, and they, in most cases, um, you know, can't play once they get to a certain age at least um, in regular able-bodied sports. We do have, a lot of our kids are not full-time wheelchair users. Um, maybe they can walk around the house or at school for a little bit, but um, um, definitely to play sports, they would need a wheelchair. Um, but um, because of that, you know, um, if they need a sports wheelchair, people don't realize that sports wheelchair costs cost about um, between two and three thousand dollars. That's just to get on the court and, and play. Period. Um, so when you're funding a team of kids, maybe ten kids that need. Um, wheelchairs to be able to play sports, then that gets to be um, pretty costly. When um, we are traveling to, we're going to a Paralympic style track and field and swimming meet um, in Indiana uh, in two weeks, and we have seven kids that are going. Um, for kids to be able to do that um, and to be able to play basketball or anything, we typically have to travel. Most of the kids you know, can go down to the local rec center or YMCA, and um, our kids love being able to travel and love meeting the kids that they meet at other meets and things. Um, and we fuse, like um, I said, independent activities into that. We expect them to take care of their own personal care needs and to carry their own food in, when they, you know, in the mornings for in the hotel for breakfast and things like that. So it's a, a way we fuse activities, but um, it definitely does bring about um, a big cost need because, um, you know. They simply can't go to the local YMCA to play to play sports, um, but the rewards they get out of is is definitely worth the cost. But it definitely is um, something that we have to, to fundraise for for sure. Gail, do you want to say anything briefly? Yes, we we do have some revenue from our clinic and our preschool, but we have forty percent more staff in our school than we're required to have, and then on our clinic. Our, our reimbursements for our clinical services, about 67% of those are reimbursed to us at rates lower than our cost through insurance companies and in the state of Tennessee. So we raise about $600,000 a year. It's kind of equal between um, grants and individual donors. We're also a United Way partner agency and then uh, oh, many foundations. So we do have a golf tournament coming up May 21st at Brentwood Country Club. And we have some other songwriter events. We've been at the Ryman the last three years um, for songwriter events. And then we have a small songwriter event at Leapers, in Leapers Fork at Green's Grocery in February. It's a blast. Great. Um, recently, the city of Franklin adopted a plan, a concept plan, for the new Southeast Park on Carruthers Parkway. And many of the people sitting at this table have been working with Franklin tomorrow and other organizations over the last year or year and a half to identify needs that exist in our community for recreation uh, that are not currently being met um, through what existing facilities but the new concept plan includes an inclusive playground and accessible playground tell us a little bit about how important that is Gail, you have a, a site at a private at your private facility, right. and then Amy can talk about that a little yeah. bit too. We do have an inclusive playground at, at uh, High Hopes, and so we are very willing to help the city with the design of this, and it's so needed because so many times children can't, the, the playground facilities are not accessible to them or to their family members who might be in a wheelchair. And so it is hugely important for quality of life in our community that all of our parks and playgrounds are open to all people, regardless of their, of their uh, physical capabilities. So it is, it's a huge thing. I commend our city and Franklin Tomorrow for being so interested in this, and it's just another feather in the cap of Williamson County. It really is. Amy, talk about how 
important. I mean, we've had a lot of fun going to play on some of these playgrounds together. Uh, yeah, they're for adults too. We, we had a great time, but tell us a little bit how important you think this yeah. is for the community. You know, for me, from a personal standpoint, um, uh, recently I um, found a, a swing that I could sit in that had a back to it and everything. Y'all, I hadn't been on a swing in 30 years, you know, and, and when you think about, you know, that as being such a staple of, of childhood, and there's so many children that don't get to experience that because, you know, there's nothing that are capable, you know, that are equipped for their needs, that, you know, it, it's such an important thing for children to be able to play, you know, um, when you have a playground, typical playgrounds that not only, you know, can you not climb on it or, you know, get on the, the, the um, the stuff, you know, there, there's a motel around it, a wheelchair can't go, go there, so, you know, you, you're stuck sitting there and all your friends are having a blast and, you know, you, you, you as a wheelchair user or, or any other type of disability that's, you know, this mobility, you know, you can't, you can't use it. And, and, you know, I think, you know, most people think about, you know, what a, a wonderful experience getting to go play um, as, as a child is on a playground and um, all of our kids all of our kids miss that and so um, I think having that incl inclusive playground is, is really important um, it's not only important I think for the kid um, with a disability uh, that gets that experience but um, you know people with disabilities especially you know in my organization I see kids that we have kids that are in college that are going to do great things and be community leaders like all of y'all well if they can't get on a playground and have those experiences playing with other kids without disabilities, then you know something as simple as that feeds into um, people not hiring them as when they get older because they've they've never known anybody with, with a disability before. So if something as simple as, as a playground really can have lifelong benefits to um, people with disabilities being integrated into society. And, and so um, when you think about that playground that seems so small, really isn't small at all. Um. Go ahead. I just wanted to, um, before we leave today, make sure everybody has an invitation to come to Brightstone. We have what's called big events. It's Brightstone is growing. We would love for you to come and visit the facility. We take everyone on a tour of our current facility and then we just drive five minutes, which is fabulous, to the land and let you see this gorgeous piece of property. We'll even feed you lunch. So please let me know and take our brochure with our information in it. It has a little map of uh, our new facility. I just wanna make sure they have the invite. Great, thank you so much. And I wanna say about the inclusive playground, inclusive and accessible playground. This year, Franklin Amaro is focusing on creating an infrastructure for a public-private partnership between the city and other organizations that will help create this new playground as part of the first phase of the new park. And we are very excited to be partnering and having studied this for a couple years and working with these organizations. And if you're interested in being part of the group studying that and putting that together, we'd be happy to have your involvement as we move forward this, probably this early summer into getting active on what will be this great facility. We're so excited about that. Let's thank these, this great panel. We also wanna thank um, Brian Wolf from Community Coffee for a great morning over there with coffee and donuts. Frank Talks is always the second Monday of the month. Sometimes the time is different and the location, we move around the city, but we could not do this without the Vanderbilt University of Office, Office of Community, Neighborhood and Government Relations and also our new partner, Renaissance Bank. So we appreciate their support, certainly for these events. Thank you so much and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Mimi. Great.